Thank you all for coming. I would like to thank the Korea Society for hosting this event tonight. My artwork, my artwork, Confirm Unwanted, explores, to, explores the issue of 200,000 young girls known as Comfort Women who are systematically exploited as sex slaves in Asia during World War II and increases awareness of sexual violence against women during wartime. This military conformance system was carefully planned, organized, and implemented by the Japanese army on an industrial scale not seen before in modern history. This systematic exploitation is the largest case of human trafficking in the 20th century, yet it never got acknowledged. In Asia, this issue remains taboo and controversial. At the same time, it is almost unknown in the West. I began to pay attention to the confirmation issue because of a front page article in the New York Times on March 8th in 2007. The article was related to Resolution 121, also known as the Confirmation Resolution which was proposed by Mike Honda, Japanese-American Californian congressman. The Asian community worked to pass this resolution, asking Japan to take responsibility for the conformant issue. Three conformant survivors, two Korean and one Dutch, testified in the US Congress at the time. One of them said, we used to get raped by 50 soldiers a day. It was a shocking revelation that provoked me to start my confirmation project. The resolution was successfully event eventually passed on July 30th in 2007. In my initial research and reading, I was surprised to find that it wasn't only Korean women who got enslaved, but many other Asian women and even European women in, in Asia. I realized this wasn't just a Korean issue, but an important international human rights issue that got forgotten. Before I present my video artwork, I would like to share a brief history of conformance and my research in Asia. The military conformance system was implemented because of two main reasons. First, prevention of sexual diseases for soldiers. In, 1930, that in 1931, when Japan invaded Manchuria, Japanese prostitutes, so-called comfort women, followed the army. The problem was these women had been working as a prostitute for many years already, and sexual diseases became a huge problem. The, mil the Japanese military was surprised to find that they lost more soldiers because of sexual diseases than in battle. This was the main reason why they targeted young girls and virgins. Second, preventing soldiers from raping local women. This is directly related to the rape of Nanking in 1937. Over 20,000 Chinese women were raped by soldiers, and this became a big international embarrassment for Japan. To the Japanese government, this was a publicity problem. It's not because they care about women, but they didn't want to lose face internationally. So in order to solve these problems, they systematically kidnap and deceive young girls all over in Asia. There are three typical methods they use. First, virgin, recru virgin recruitment. At the time, Korea and Taiwan had already been colonized by Japan. In Korea, the Japanese government pressured young girls to volunteer to support Japan's war, war efforts. Of course, it was never voluntary, it was mandatory. Most of these girls who were, who were forced to volunteer became sex, became sex slaves. Second, kidnapping. In many, case, in many cases, a truck came to a small town and grabbed 10 to 20 girls in the streets and drove off. No one knew what, what was going on, but girls were disappearing. 
in one case, it was announced that there was a there was free candy at the train station, so many children went and got kidnapped. Third, deception. Like so many other human trafficking cases, they targeted girls from very very poor families. Girls were told they work as nurses or factory workers, but instead they became sex slaves. The conformance system is the largest case of human trafficking in the 20th century. Today, human trafficking is the fast-growing industry in the world and the second largest business after arms dealing in the 21st century. So, the conformance issue is not just about the past; it is very relevant today. These girls were as young as 11 years old. They were raped by between 10 to 100 soldiers a day. At military rape camps known as confrontations, according to some Japanese military documents, they are listed as supplies. To the military, girls are a disposable commodity, and one of many war supplies they need for soldiers. Girls are starved, bitten, tortured, and killed. Only 25 to 30 percent survive the ordeal. So after learning the history, I decided to go to Asia to meet survivors and hear their stories. Since 2007, I have met 21 survivors in seven different seven different countries, including Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indonesian, Filipino, and Dutch conformist survivors, as well as a former Japanese soldier. The reason I I traveled to all these countries is because. I want people to understand the conformity issue, not as a Korean or an, an or an Asian only issue, but as an important international human rights issue. So first, I went to Korea in 2008. The conformity movement was initially organized by two professors, Professor Jung Ok Yoo and Professor Hyo Jae Lee, in the early 1990s. To Professor Yoon, this issue was very personal. During the war, as a college student at Iwa Women's University in Seoul, she saw many of her classmates forced to volunteer as part of the virgin recruitment. Her parents got very suspicious and convinced her to co- convince her to quit the college. This may have saved her. As she could have, she could have become a conformist herself. Many years later, she wondered about her friends who were forced to volunteer. She said, "Men came back after the war, but the women never came back. So I went out looking for them." Eventually, she found the first Korean conformist in Okinawa, in Japan, in the all in the nineteen nineteen seventies. With the professor Hyo Jae Lee, they worked together to bring out the conformity issue internationally. When Kim Ak Soon, a, a Korean conformity survivor, heard about Japan's denial, saying that these women are just prostitutes who had been recruited by civilians to make money, she decided to speak up. She became the first conformity to come out publicly. These are her words when she broke her silence on August 14th in 1991. She said, "I'm Kim Ak Soon, who was forced to become a Japanese military conformist. I made my decision when I saw the articles in the newspapers and on TV. They weren't true. This has to be straight up. I don't know why Japan still lies to us. So I came out. No one told me to do so. I did it on my own." I'm almost seventy years old. I don't care if I die now. I was scared at first. Even if it kills me, I have no regrets. I have to say what I have to say. You must know, this happened in the past, but this should never happen again in the future. Her courage inspired so many other women survivors, including Dutch. Including Jan Ruff O'Hara, a Dutch conformist survivor living in Australia. 
When I had a lunch with Jen in Australia in 2011, she said, she told me, I saw Kim Ak Sun speaking out, speaking out on TV in my living room, and I thought if Kim Ak Sun could do it, I could do it too. Kim Ak Sun was an ordinary woman who spoke out for herself and for women everywhere. This is called the Wednesday protest. Every Wednesday since 1992, people gather with the survivors in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul to protest demanding justice. The first time when I went there, it was monsoon season in Korea. The weather was horrible, very windy and rainy. Yet amazingly, these 80 or 90 year old women survivors would show up, rain or shine. As long as they're healthy enough to walk, they will show up, sitting in the front row, as you can see in the, in the photo. There are several hundred people. It was, a, it was very lively, almost like a little festival. Some people made speeches, others performed for the survivors. The Korean feminists and activists made a couple of homes for the survivors. This is one of them. It's called Shimta, means the resting place in Seoul. This is the entrance. It's a big house, and several conformant survivors live there. Another one is called Nanameji, means the house of a sharing. I stayed there for a week and had a chance to get to know the survivors. In Korea, over 250 conformant survivors came out in the 1990s. Now, now less than 60 sur survivors are still alive. These are some of the uh, survivors at Nanameji, Pagok Nyon and Iyokson Helmani. Helmani means the grandma in Korean. In Asia, any woman old enough to be your grandmother, we refer to as grandma, even if she's not related to you. Iyokson Helmani in the middle, she's very articulate and you're gonna hear her story later in the video. Kang Yeo Helmani, Kim Sunok Helmani, Pagokson Helmani, Kim Gunja Helmani, Iyong Su Helmani. Iyong Su Helmani was one of the three women conformance survivors who testified in the US Congress in 2007. She has a very strong personality and you're gonna hear her voice later in the video. At Nanameji, they also have a museum. It's called the Museum of Japanese Imperial Army's Sexual Slavery and the Center for Peace and Human Rights. There are a lot of displays related to the history, and this is one of them. This is a photo of a former conversations in yeah. Asia. This is an example, example room at a conversation in the museum. This is a historical photo of Japanese soldiers waiting in waiting line at a conversation. Another conversation photo. This is another historical photo of a conversation soldiers at confrontation. After Korea, I went to Taiwan. In Taiwan, 58 conformant survivors came out. Now less than 10 survivors are still alive. Chinwa Ama. Ama means grandma in Taiwanese. She's a Taiwanese conformant survivor. She's very warm and friendly, and you're going to hear her story later in the video. Meme Lu and Yi Cho Yu Su Ama. They're both Hakanese. Suyu Mei Wu Ama, she's also Hakanese. Suyu Feng Hu Ama, she's an original Taiwanese. Then I went to Japan. First, I went WAM, Women's Active Museum on War and Peace in Tokyo. These are activists. This is one of their displays. It's a map of locations of conversations all over in Asia. With their help, I interviewed Mr. Kaneko, a former Japanese soldier. In 2010, I went to China. I met Professor Su Jilang at Shanghai Normal University. He's the one who started the Conform Movement in China. At the university, they have a Conform Museum. This is one of their displays. This is a Japanese military condom during the war. 
Then I went to Shanxi to meet an Aiwa Danyang. Danyang means grandma in Chinese. She's the first Chinese conformant to come out publicly. She's a very tiny woman, but very feisty. The one on the left is her adopted daughter. I also visit a few former military conversations, including this one. This is called Dai Salong. Dai Salong was the first conversation ever in Asia. It was established, established in Shanghai in 1932. In Shanghai alone, there were 158 conversations. This was, this is the entrance. This used to be a guard tower. You could still see some traces of the Japanese past. This is a wooden carving of Mount Fuji. This is a historical photo of Dai Salang during the war. Another conversation called Mei Mei Li. This is a huge complex of buildings. It covers three or four blocks. I heard the first one, Dai Salang, was mainly for officers, whereas uh, this one, Mei Mei Li, was mainly for ordinary soldiers. After China, I went to Indonesia. I met Emma Kasima, an Indo Indonesian conformist survivor. She lived with her, her adopted daughter and grandchildren. She's very graceful, and you're going to hear her story later in the video. This is a former military conversation in Indonesia. When the Japanese invaded Indonesia, Indonesia had already been colonized by the Dutch over 200 years. This was a Dutch officer's home, and the Japanese turned it into a conversation. Also, this is where Emma Kastima had been locked in for almost two years. Another conversation. As you can see, it's still very Dutch. In 2011, I went to Australia to meet Jem Rob O'Haran, a Dutch conformist survivor. When the Japanese invaded Indonesia, first Dutch people were put into prison camps. From there, they selected a few hundred Dutch girls and sent them to conference stations. Jen was one of them. She's the first European woman to come out publicly. Also, she, she is one of the three conformance survivors who testified in the US Congress in 2007. She's very elegant and artistic, and you're gonna hear her story in the, in the video. This was my last trip. In 2012, I went to the Philippines. I met Lola Julia Polas. Lola means a grandma in Filipino. Then I met Lola Fidencia David. She's very outspoken, and you're going to hear her story in the video later. As a result of my trips to Asia, I created a series of artworks. The project is called Conforma Wanted. The title is reference to ads that appear in, in Asian newspapers during the war. These were in Korean newspapers, and here, Gyeongseong Ilbo, it says, Conforma Wanted immediately in a larger scale. And the other one in Mail Shinbo, it says, military conforma wanted. When there aren't enough volunteer prostitutes through the ad campaigns, both Asian and European, European women in Asia were kidnapped or, or deceived and forced into sex slavery. So I thought this is an important historical reference because this is how it all began. My artwork involves ad like billboards, street posters, audio, and multi channel video installations. This was at the Incheon Woman Artist Biennial in Korea in 2009. In the middle, there is a portrait of a Taiwanese conformance survivor. Her name is Mei Chen. This photo was taken by a Japanese soldier during her enslavement at a conversation. She is surrounded by gold leaf like a saint's halo in a Renaissance painting. I wanted to honor their courage to speak up. So if the first one is a woman, a young woman around the time of enslavement, this is a woman now. A silhouette of an aged conformance survivor against a black and white photo of, photo of her current home. 
And here I wanted to explore the idea of home. Of those who survived, many never went back home because of their shameful past. In a conservative society, chastity was the most important thing to women at the time. So in here, I wanted to create a sense of loss. Outdoor billboard installation, indoor audio installation. This was a spaces gallery in Cleveland, Ohio in 2011. Yeah. A billboard, a poster with a QR code, indoor installation, Here's a part of a multi-channel video installation in, in the gallery. Two, two videos of the soldier and of the woman, woman survivors are projected on opposite walls. This is a video of the woman survivors. This was at 1A Space Gallery in Hong Kong in 2012. This is a video of the soldier, which was projected at floor level. From May to October 6th in 2013, I presented public art throughout New York City. In May, an art display in Chelsea was presented in collaboration with the New York City Department of Transportation's Urban Art Program. One side is in English with a QR code. This is a portrait of Jen when she was young, right before the war. The other side is in Chinese with the QR code. This is a portrait of Mei Chen. In September, the phone booth posters in English, Korean, Chinese, and Japanese were presented throughout New York City at major sites. This was in Times Square, poster in English with the QR code. This was in Koreatown, poster in Korean and English. One is a portrait of Yong Sahemani when she was 18 years old, right, right after the war. And the other one is a portrait of Jen. This was in the Flatiron District on 23rd Street. I saw some people scanning the QR code. This is a poster in Japanese in Little Tokyo in the East Village. I saw some Japanese students looking at the poster and scanning the, scanning the QR code. This was in Union Square. This poster was up at Lincoln Center during the Fashion Week in September. Some people are taking photos. This was at night at Lincoln Center. Before presenting the video, I would like to say a few last words. I hope we understand the confrontment issue, not based on nationalism, but from a humanistic point of view. This is not about nation against nation. This is about what women are going through during wartime, but is never talked about. This is about an important international human rights issue that got forgotten. We don't learn about the Holocaust to hate Germany or black slavery to hate white Americans in this country. We remember so we don't repeat the same mistake again. The acknowledgement of the confirmation issue will help women everywhere in every nation and culture. Also, I hope we can change our perception of these women as I traveled through many countries in Asia, I saw so much shame surrounding this issue. Often people look at them as broken flowers that we feel sorry for, or our shameful past that we all want to forget about. It was truly inspiring to meet them and a great honor. They are really, really amazing people, so strong, resilient, and courageous survivors, at the same time loving and caring grandmas. I hope we remember them as a source of our inspiration and empowerment. They dare to tell us extremely, extremely difficult personal stories so we don't forget. 
Now I would like to present a video based on interviews with the survivors. They talk about their experiences at military rape camp, military conversations, as well as their hopes and dreams. Also, they sing their favorite traditional songs. This video looks at the history through the memory of the survivors. These are the stories and voices of the survivors. ね、8時を8。あのね、いや、時間が短いってのはね、形、形で説明しなくて分かんないでしょ。女の方は気持ちでしょ。ね、気持ちね。でしょ。ところがね、女の方はこうやって悪いんだけどさ、こうやってだけ
had to line up in the compound. Until in the end, there were 10 girls left of their choice. And I happened to be one of those 10. And there was a truck waiting for us to be taken away. We didn't know where we were going. Our mothers were all screaming and crying. And, you know, it was just absolutely terrible. Um, it was quite a long drive. And it stopped in front of a large colonial style house. We were so scared, we all hunted together in the one big bed at night. The next night, we realized that we were in a brothel because the Japanese, a Japanese officer came in that day and told us we were in this house for the sexual pleasure of the Japanese military. We were turned into military sex slaves. Ji 我们的人<音樂> magbigay sila ng konting apology sa mga nagawa nila sa amin biktima. Kaya, iyon ang aming pinaglalaban. Yung nangyari sa amin, lola, tsaka sa pamilya namin, mag-20 mag years na kami ngayon na lumalaban. Nama saya Emma Kastima. Emma Kastima. Emma Kastima. Umur 80. Satu. Dah. Lebih 80 lebih. Ke belanja. Ya. Ketemu sama Depa. Terus dibawa. Terus dibawa tu kalau ke mobil. Terus dibawa nanti sebut tadi Kalianjo. Lianjo sebut tadi kumpulan perempuan dari Lianjo. Belanjo ada di tempat perempuan dia. Apa ini bawa kalian tu? Kumpulkan nanti dikerjakan, dikasih kerja. Besi kumpulkan, tunggu seminggu, tunggu parik sarotor dulu, parik sarotor lama-lama. Tapi jo-jo-jo Jepang, banyak Jepang dengan jahin cerita. Jadi orang terkuruk, seorang-seorang dia banyak tentara-tentara Jepang datang gitu tak? Jadi cakap. Bukan disuruh kerja di kerja ini tu macam susah tak aduh susah, aduh sakit hati saya tanya, ada dua, dua ayah nunggu mampel eh, ayah nunggu itu nya, aduh sakit hati tanya, saya nggak mau panjat dari kaki nggak mau. Tapi ni susah, dia mau cang. When 
，那只有在做心，那只有在决心。